This chapter will cover chapter three and the process costing system. We are going to talk about how it is unique to the job order system and how we account for the flow of goods. One thing unique in this chapter will be discussing equivalent units and then from there we'll prepare a production cost report. So the process cost system is utilized when we are manufacturing very similar products that are mass produced. Examples could be cereal, paint, manufacturing steel. One that hits real close to home here in Minnesota is oil refining, such as the Coke Refining, Refining and Marathon Oil Companies, along with soft drinks. In the process cost system, the process is continual manufacturing of a similar product. Here you see Pepsi, Jones Soda, for oil, in this example, Exxon or Royal Dutch, with computer chips, Intel, or with chemicals, Dow Company. The distinction between the process and the job order would be, as we see, advertising is unique to the company that they're working for. Disney, each movie is going to be unique from another type of movie. Um, Health care is very unique. Um, what is provided for one patient is going to be unique from another patient. Which of the following items is not a characteristic of a PROS cost system? Now, as you know, I'm going to provide you with these test questions so that way you have an understanding of what may be similar to the actual quiz. So what's not characteristic of a PROS system? A, once production begins, it continues until the finished product emerges. B, the focus is on continually producing homogeneous products. C, when the finished product emerges, all units have precisely the same amount of materials, labor, and overhead. Or D, the products produced are heterogeneous in nature. Well, I hope you got that one right. It's D. The products in a process cost system are homogenous in nature. Service companies that provide very specific, non-routine services are going to be part of the job order cost system. But those that are routine and repetitive are probably going to utilize the process system. Similarities and differences in a job order cost, they're going to be assigned to each job. Where in a process cost system, the costs are track, uh, tracked through a series of connected manufacturing processes or departments. In a job order cost, products have unique characteristics, but in a process co cost, they are not unique. They are very uniform and um, homogenous in nature because it's such a large volume. In a job order cost system, we take the direct materials, labor, and manufacturing overhead and we apply them to very specific jobs. After the job is completed, we transfer it to finished goods, and then once those products have sold, they are transferred to cost of goods sold. In a process cost system, we are going to take those various products and assign them in directly into work in process to specific departments. Department A, then from there they may flow to Department B, and then once they have finished with the various processes through departments, they will then end up in finished goods, and once they are sold, they will go into the cost of goods. The similarities between the two process flows are the manufacturing cost elements, direct materials, direct labor, 
and manufacturing overhead. Another similarity is how we accumulate those costs. And the flow of costs will be similar between both processes. The differences relate to the number of work and process accounts used, and the documents we're going to use to track those costs, and where we the costs are totaled. And then in the process system, we are going to have a unit cost computation. Unlike the job order cost, it's a job order computation. So we start with the various accounts um, work in process. We're going to have documents that are used. In the job order system, we're using job cost sheets. In the production cost system, we have production cost reports. Related to the work in process, there's only going to be one work in process account. But in the process system, we may um, put those materials in different work in process accounts. Certain materials may be added in Department A. Other materials may be added in a future department. The determination of total manufacturing costs in a job order system is done per job. We're in a process system, it's going to be done each period. And then lastly, the unit cost computation. The cost of each job divided by the units produced for that job will be how we determine the unit per job. In a process system, we're going to come up with a new term called equivalent units produced during the period. Here's a new question for you. Indicate which of the following statements is not correct. Both a job order and a process cost system track the same three manufacturing cost elements direct materials, direct labor, and manufacturing overhead. In a job order cost system, only one work and process account is used, whereas in a process cost system, multiple work and process accounts are used. Manufacturing costs are accumulated the same way in a job order and in a process cost system. And manufacturing costs are assigned the same way in a job order and in a process cost system. So which of these statements is not correct? D. They are not assigned in the same way. Okay, let's look at the do it question here, we're good, where we're going to compare the job order and the process cost system. Indicate whether the item is true or false. Number one, a law firm is likely to use process costing for major lawsuits. I don't think so. A manufacturer of paintballs is likely to use process costing. Well, paintballs are the same verse for one paintball versus another, so that would be a true statement. Both job order and process costing determine product cost at the end of a period of time rather than when the product is completed. Nope. And then number four, process costing does not keep track of manufacturing overhead. Well, process costing has to keep track of manufacturing overhead. That's a critical cost in both processes. Now let's look at the flow, the process cost flow. So we've got an example here of Tyler Manufacturing Company has roller blade and skateboard wheels that it sells to manufacturers and retail outlets. Manufacturing consists of two processes, machining and assembly. So you're going to have a machine department and then an assembly department. The machining department shapes, hones, and drills the raw materials. And then the assembly department assembles and packages the parts. So as you see here, various manufacturing costs can be assigned to either the work in process department of machining, and it also can be assigned to the work in process assembly department. From there, the work in process that starts in machining gets transferred 
to the work and process of the assembly department. And in addition, new manufacturing costs can be assigned to just that assembly department. Once the assembly department has done the completion of the products, it's then assigned to finished goods. When those goods are sold, then it's going to go out of finished goods and be debited to cost of goods sold. Accumulation of the cost of materials, labor, and overhead is the same as in job order costing. So accumulating the goods is the same, but the assignment of the manufacturing elements is different from in a job order system. In, as it relates to material cost, a process cost system requires fewer material requisition slips than would in a job order cost system. Materials are used for processes, not specific jobs. In our example of the wheels, various materials may be used to manufacture, create those wheels. But then in the assembly aspect, new materials may be brought into that department to complete the assembly of those wheels. Requisitions are required for larger quantities of materials in the process system. And we will, again, create a journal entry, just like in the job order system, to record those materials used. So we may have certain materials that just go into the machining. We may have certain materials that will just go into assembly and the credit to both of those work in process will be raw materials inventory since they're going out of that inventory category and going into a whip of either manufacturing or assembly. As in factory labor cost, tickets are used in both systems. All labor costs incurred within a production department are a cost of processing. So the journal entry will be whip for machining, whip for assembly, and we will credit our factory labor. And then in our manufacturing overheads, we are going to allocate the overhead to the various departments. The activity is going to drive the costs. So if machine time is the predominant factor here, that is what we're going to use as our driver. We will put our manufacturing overhead costs associated with machining into machining and the whip of assembly into assembly. And of course, the credit will go against the manufacturing overhead. So in this particular example, we're looking at Caterpillar. The um, I'm just going to read this. In one of its automated cost centers, Caterpillar feeds work into the cost center where robotic machines process it and transfer the finished job to the next cost center without human intervention. One person tends all the machines and spends more time maintaining machines than operating them. In such cases, overhead rates based on direct labor hours may be misleading but some companies continue to assign manufacturing overhead on the basis of direct labor hours, despite there is no cause and effect between labor and overhead. Oftentimes, it's the machining hours that would be more applicable. So, in assigning manufacturing overheads, we are going to create a journal entry that transfers the goods to the next department which in this case, we will transfer them out of machining and into assembly. As you see, we would debit our whip assembly and we will transfer it out of machining, which would be a credit to machining. Once we have completed the goods, they are going to go out of machining, which is, would be a credit to whip assembly, and, excuse me, not out of machining, out of assembly, and they will be debited into finished goods. And then once we have sold those goods, 
they're going to go out of finished goods, which would be a credit, and into a debit to cost of goods sold. Another question for you. In making the journal entry to assign raw materials, A, the debit is to finish goods inventory, B, the debit is often to two or more WIP accounts, C, the credit is generally to two or more process accounts, or D, the credit is to finished goods inventory. Now think about this. Assigning raw materials is at the beginning stage. So those will go into various WIP accounts. So as we see here, and we talked about in a previous slide, some materials get assigned to one WIP, others wait until they go into another department. Here's another one. A product requires processing in two departments, the baking department and then the packaging department before it is completed. Costs transferred out of the baking department will be transferred into what? Well, if it starts in the baking department and then part of the process is to package them, it will then go right into the WIP packaging department. Here we've got another do it. Blue Diamond Company manufactures Zebo through two processes, blending and bottling. In June, raw materials used were blending of 18,000 and bottling of 4,000. Factory labor costs were blending 12,000 and bottling 5,000. Manufacturing overhead costs were blending of six and bottling of 2,500. The company transfers units completed at a cost of 19,000 in the blending department to the bottling department. The bottling department transfers units completed at a cost of 11,000 to finished goods. So we are going to be required to journalize all of these entries. So we're going to start with raw materials. We see here that we first are going to credit our raw materials inventory for 22,000 and assign them to the various departments. Whip blending was 18, whip bottling was four. Now, as it relates to factory labor, we assign whip blending of 12, whip bottling of five, and we will credit our factory labor of 17,000. Next, assigning our overhead to production told us our whip blending is six, our whip bottling is 2,500, and we'll credit the manufacturing overhead of 2,500. Then, transferring the, uh, to record the transfer of units to the bottling department, we are going to take them out of blending and we're going to debit them into our WIP bottling department. Once everything has been completed in our bottling department, we will then transfer them out of the bottling department and debit them into our finished goods inventory. Suppose you have a work-study job in the office of your college president, and she asks you to compute the cost of instruction per full-time equivalent student at your college. The college's vice president for finance provides this following information. All the cost of instruction is $9 million. There are 900 full-time students and 1,000 part-time students. So what we need to do is come up with what e an equivalent unit is going to be. In this example, part-time students take 60% of the classes of a full-time student for the year. So to compute the number of full-time equivalent students, we would then take our full-time students of 900 create an equivalent of part-time students to full-time students. So if we have a thousand part-time students, but they equate to 60% of a full-time student. So that really gives us 600 full-time students equivalent 
related to the thousand part-time students. Excuse me, a thousand times sixty, yes, so six hundred, so the nine hundred plus six hundred gives us five hundred full-time equivalents. So the cost of nine million, dividing that by our equivalent students of fifteen hundred, provide us with a cost per full-time equivalent of six thousand dollars per full-time equivalent student. Now, the degree of completion of units completed and transferred out and units in, of ending work in process. We are going to use the weighted average method since this is the most common. The beginning WIP is not going to be part of the computation of equivalent units. So, the output of Cory Company's packaging department during the period consists of 10,000 units completed and transferred out and 5,000 units in ending work in process which are 70 percent completed. So we are required to calculate the equivalent units of production. So we know we've completed 10,000 units but the items in WIP in the ending work in process are completed at 70%. So we've got 5,000 at 70% or 3,500 units that have been completed. So our ending department here would show 13,500 equivalent units of production. Here's an example where Kellogg has produced Eggo waffles. Three departments produce these waffles. They first mix, then they transfer them to baking, and then they transfer them to the freezing and packaging department. The mixing department combines the dry ingredients, the flour, the salt, and the baking powder with the liquid ingredients, including eggs and vegetable oil, to make the waffle batter. We are going to look to see how this relates to just the mixing department as of the end of June. So in this um, slide here, this is the information as it relates to the mixing department. We began the period with in June on June 1st with whip of a hundred thousand units. We added into production 800,000 units, so we had total units of 900,000. We transferred out 700,000 units during June, and our WIP at the end of June, or June 30th, is 200,000 units. Now, of those 200,000 units, the percentage complete of materials was 100%. The percentage complete of conversion cost was only at 60 percent. So as you see here between the units transferred out and the WIP our total units are of 900,000 but we need to come up with the equivalent units during doing the weighted average method. So the WIP of the 200,000 units as it relates to materials is at 100 percent. 200,000 equivalent units. The WIP as it relates to conversion cost is only at 60% complete, which would be 120,000 units. So the equivalent units related to materials would be 900,000. The equivalent units related to conversion cost would be 820,000 units. Conversion costs include labor costs plus overhead costs. Materials are pure materials, direct materials. The conversion costs include manufacturing overhead plus our labor costs. It's really important to know because you're going to see this on the quiz. That beginning WIP is not part of the equivalent units of production formula. Please remember that. The only piece that's part of the equivalent units of production formula will be the work that was transferred out 
and then the whip at the end of the the process the period how they relate to materials versus conversion costs so the units completed and transferred out plus the equivalent units of ending whip for materials will equal the equivalent units of production for materials and then the units completed and transferred out for conversion costs plus the whip in that department conversion costs are going to equal the equivalent units of production for conversion costs so we're going to separate out the materials equivalent units and the conversion costs equivalent units so let's take a look at this the mixing department's output during the period consists of 20,000 units completed and transferred out and 5,000 units in ending work and process 60% complete as to materials and conversion cost. Beginning inventory is 1,000 units, we don't care about that, and 40% as to materials and conversion cost. The equivalent units of production are what? Well, we know 20,000 were transferred out, and 5,000 units were in ending inventory, 60% complete. So what would be the equivalent units? Well we know the 20,000 transferred out plus 60 percent of those 5,000 or 3,000 so 23,000 units would be the units of production. Let's now take a look at this one. The fabricating department outdoor essentials has the following production and cost data for the current month. Zero began, they transferred out 15,000 units, and we have in ending whip 10,000 units. Materials are entered at the beginning of the process. The ending work and process units are 30% complete as to conversion costs. So compute the equivalent units of production for materials and then also for conversion costs. So we know that the materials were entered at the beginning of the process. So we know that the materials have been totally um, completed. So we would for materials have the 25,000 for equivalent units. Let me show you on here. For materials, units transferred out 15, ending units of work and pro process units 10. So as it relates to materials, it would be 25,000. Now as it relates to conversion costs, we know 15,000 were transferred out, so they were completed. But the 10,000 units that are in work and process we're only 30% conversion costs um, added. So then we know we would have equivalent units of 3,000 there for a total of 18,000. Let's look at another question here. Barnes & Miller Manufacturing is trying to determine the equivalent units for conversion costs with 10,000 units of ending work and process at 80% completion and 32,000 physical units. There are no beginning units in the department. Conversion costs occur evenly throughout the entire production. What are the equivalent units for conversion costs for the current period? So if we know that there were total 32,000 physical units but out of those 32,000, 10,000 of those are in work in process at 80% completion. So what that would show for us is that we have 22,000 that were totally completed, transferred out, and then the remaining of 10,000 
were completed at 80% or 8,000. So the 22,000 that were transferred out, the 8,000 equivalent units that are in WIP would total equivalent units for conversion cost of 30,000. Here's another one. A department adds raw materials to a process at the beginning of the process and incurs conversion costs uniformly throughout the process. For the month of January, there were no units in the beginning WIP. 90,000 units were started into production in January, and there were 20,000 units that were 40% complete in the ending work and process inventory at the end of January. What were the equivalent units of production for conversion cost? 90,000 units were started. We know 70,000 units were totally transferred out, and 20,000 are in 40% complete. So our 70,000 transferred out are complete in relation to conversion cost. The 20,000 in WIP were only 40% complete, which would be 8,000 units. Therefore, our 70 plus our 8,000 equivalent units in WIP at the end of the period would give us equivalent units of 78,000 equivalent units. Here's another one. Ganter Company had the following department information about physical units and percent of completion. <clears throat> it starts with our WIP, beginning, what was completed and transferred out, and then WIP at the end of the period. If materials are added at the beginning of the production process, what is the total number of equivalent units for materials during May? Well, 180,000 was transferred out. We have 50,000 still in WIP, but we know the materials were put in at the very beginning of the process. So for just materials, not conversion, but just materials, we should have 230,000 of equivalent units for materials in May because all materials get added at the beginning of the process. Let's take a moment now and go over some problems. So let me go to the book and let's look at E2. Exercise E3-2. Okay, as you see here in E3-2, Harrelson Company manufactures pizza sauce through two production departments cooking and canning. In each process, materials and conversion costs are incurred evenly throughout the process. For the month of April, the work and process accounts show the following debits. So these are debits. The cooking has materials added of 21,000, labor is added to cooking of 8,500 and overhead of 31,500. For canning, the beginning whip was 4,000, materials of 9, labor of 7, and overhead of 258. So the cost transferred in to canning is 53,000. We are required to journalize all of these transactions. So let me pull up a, I'll just do a, um, Word doc. And let's see how we'll do this. So getting back to the first thing we're going to do is create the journal entry for materials. We see cooking of 21 and canning of 9. So we will say for April 30th, whip for cooking is going to be 21,000. Whip for 
canning is going to be 9,000. And we've got a credit to raw materials inventory for 30,000, the combination of both. Now let's look at factory overhead or labor, or excuse me, labor. Transferred into cooking was 8,500, is 8,500. Transferred into canning is 7,000. So what we're going to do here is our whip for cooking is 8,500 as a debit. Our whip for canning is 7,000. And our credit is to factory labor for the total of 15.5. Next, our manufacturing overhead. This shows us overhead was transferred into cooking of 31.5, transferred into canning of 25.8. So we will have to whip cooking of 31.5. Whip for canning excuse me here of twenty five thousand eight hundred and we will credit our manufacturing overhead. Whoops, I spelt factory wrong. I'm sorry. Manufacturing overhead for a total of 57300 Then we see the costs transferred in to canning of 53000 So what that means is all of our cooking costs here, the specific cooking costs were transferred in to the canning. So again, what we will show is our whip canning, 53,000 was transferred in, and we'll want to credit our cooking because the only place that the whip can come from would be cooking since cooking happens first then canning happens next so they get taken out of cooking and they get transferred in to the whip canning let's look at e3 whoops A ledger of American company has the following work in process account. Production records show that there were 400 units in the beginning inventory, 30% complete, 1,600 units started, and 1,700 units transferred out. The beginning work in process had materials cost of 2,040, and conversion costs of fifteen fifty. Um, the units in Indian inventory were forty percent complete. Materials are entered at the beginning of the painting process. So the first part for A is for us to determine how many units are in process at May 31st. I'm going to get up, pull up an Excel sheet here. So we need to know how many units are in process 
as of May 31st. Okay, so what we'll start with is let me make this a little bigger for you. We're going to start with, I'm just going to kind of create the categories I want to start with. First, oh shoot, I didn't want to do that. The first one we're going to want to start with will be whip as of May 1st. Then we're going to have started into production. Then we'll have total units to be accounted for. Then we'll have those that were transferred out. Then we'll have WIP as of May 31st. Okay? So, as you see here, if I can spell, So our whip on May 1st, production records show there were 400 units in the beginning inventory. So it's going to be 400 units here. Started into production, 600 un 1,600 units were started into production. So started into production, 1,600 units. Total units to be accounted for are 2,000 units. Units that were transferred out, the beginning working process at 2,400. Those that were transferred out, 1,700 units were transferred out. So if 1,700 units were transferred out, how many units would be in WIP at the end of the period? 300 would be in work in process at the end of the period. The next question asks us, what is the unit materials cost for May? So in order to figure out the unit materials cost, we will show, and, and I think we're going to do B and C together here because then it asks us what is the unit conversion cost for May. So I'm going to do both of these at the same time. So we'll start with over here equivalent units and we will have materials and conversion costs. Remember, conversion cost equal labor and the overhead. So we will start with our units transferred out because remember, costs have nothing to do with beginning WIP. It's only those transferred out and those in ending um, WIP. Work in process as of May 31st. So we know the units transferred out or 1,700 units for both. So the WIP for the materials, it tells us materials are entered at the beginning of the painting process. So as it relates to painting, we know that even though they're sitting in WIP, that they are complete as to materials because they're entered at the beginning of the period. So as it relates, the 300 units in WIP at 100% completion for materials would be 300 units. Therefore, our 
total costs for materials, 2000 Now, related to conversion costs, it tells us the units in ending inventory were 40% complete as to conversion costs. So, we'll take these 300 units at 40% complete. And for conversion purposes, there were only $120 in conversion costs at WIP. So, the materials or the equivalent units would be the 1700 plus the 120 or 1820 equivalent units as it relates to conversion costs. Next, D, what is the total cost of units transferred out in May? So we need to now come up with the cost of all the units transferred out in May. 